Okay, good afternoon, Mr. Ronald and Mr. Ripon and fellow lecturers from Matmaja University and my fellow friends. Uh, my name is Vincent and with my friend Henry, we are going to be today's class moderator. On this fine day, we are having a special guest from the University of Santo Tomas, Philippines, Mr. Angelito Silverio. Mr. Angelito Silverio is a lecturer and a faculty member of Electronic Engineering Department at St. Thomas University, a member of National Research Council of the Philippines, and also was a biomedical engineer at the medical, medical city in Pasig, Philippines. Mr. Angelito Silverio graduated with, with a bachelor's degree in electronics and communication engineering from the University of Santo Tomas, master's degree in electronics engineering from Antonio de Manila University, and doctor's degree in microelectronics engineering and application from Chung Yuan University, Taiwan. Mr. Angelito has achieved numerous awards and international recognition throughout his career, including the uh, first prize paper award in the 2017 IEEE International Conference on Applied System Innovation in Sapporo, Japan. Also, he is currently uh, is a project leader of two funded projects. The first is the design and development of a portable multi-sensor system for space studies. And the second is design of the wearable system for detection of, for a fall detection and vital science monitor system with wireless capability and remote data processing. He also has contributed many papers to career journals lectured and presented his paper widely before throughout many countries. In today's class, he will be sharing with us about the adventures in wearable technology research. It is a pleasure for us to have you between us today. Please welcome Mr. Angelito Silfari. The class is yours. So, um, thank you so much for, oh, let me turn on my camera for a while. So, um, Thank you everyone for this opportunity to be sharing with you some things I learned and continuous been learning uh, during the course of the project which I'm leading. Um, you can call me Mikey to make it simpler. Okay, so um, for the students, feel free to ask uh, at any time or if not, you can send uh, me an email at any time. Okay, so just call me Sir Mikey. So. Thank you again for the uh, very kind introduction. And I will truly try to make this uh, talk uh, very uh, memorable, especially for our young students. And hopefully we can come up with future collaborations together. So I will sh start sharing my screen. Uh, by the way, for the interest of my bandwidth, uh, I would have to shut off my video so um, so I can save more on the bandwidth. So uh, I'd like to share my screen. Okay, for a while. Okay, here, share. Can I have a uh, confirmation that you are seeing my screen? We are seeing your screen now. Okay, so um, hope you could join me in this adventure, in particularly in the wearable technology space. And um, okay, once again, thank you so much for this very kind um, uh, invitation to have to have this kind of lecture. So what's in store for us today? Well, first part, I would like to walk you through um, things that I found out regarding wearable devices from the, I mean, the most uh, ubiquitous, I mean, common to the more advanced and looking forward ahead. And then uh, later on, I would like to talk a little bit about, um, since if you may have noticed, I'm my, my specialization is more on microelectronic engineering. So I would love to share some items relating to sensors, interfacing, and also 
uh, analog to digital conversion, and so on and so forth. So, welcome again, and thank you for this uh, talk. So, first part, I would like to talk about wearable technologies. Uh, I want to mention that the market of wearable technologies is, is but growing. You would notice that uh, at 2027, the market is just too high, maybe around 21 billion US dollars. Um, these wearable devices could be manifested as, an, as something you wear on your wrist, something you wear uh, onto your head, like a, like a headgear, something you wear, like clothing, and so on and so forth. There are but several uh, ways to build a wearable device. Let me initially start with what will be the challenges of wearable devices. Well, especially if you talk about uh, trying to get um, signals from the body that has very, very good uh, signal-to-noise ratio or quality, definitely anything that will be moving will cause a lot of artifacts. You will see from, your, from the upper right, PPG is um, a kind of signal that represents blood flow. And for this, you are using some colors of light being reflected back and so on and so forth. So notice that when you apply some, when there is motion artifact, um, you cannot try to get a good enough PPG signal because the PPG signal is very small uh, and it's being masked by very large motion artifacts. What kinds of motion artifacts do we refer to? Let's say swinging of the arm, running, walking, or sometimes you would call it activities of daily living. Another issue of wearable devices for you to note is power. Um, am I intending to use the wearable device for long term? Let's say it is for chronic monitoring, which is fairly the case, especially for wearable devices. It had to be worn for a long period of time. And at the same time, it is trying to get data and providing for you those kinds of information. And then the other aspect that we need to consider is signal reliability. Say, for example, later on we shall have a simple case of uh, something called biopotential readout circuit. And what are the challenges therein? And you will see that uh, it's just easy to, it's not that easy to really get some uh, signals from the body, more so if it is wearable. So signal reliability or measurement accuracy. The other issue would be form factor. Of course, when you say wearable, it had to be conformal or something that conforms with, with, uh, with, 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 with wherever you're going to put it. May it be shoes, may it be a wrist type, and so on and so forth. And then normally, one issue that is not being considered is security. Of course, as they would say, do, you do not throw anything into the air or wirelessly without any form of encryption or security. So these are typical challenges that uh, would be faced by wearable devices. But what are the opportunities? Well, sensors become cheaper and cheaper and become smaller and smaller. So you might say that, well, you may not notice that somebody is wearing a sensor already because it is going towards being invisible. Sensors are ubiquitous. It's everywhere. Perhaps you have heard of uh, IoT, the Internet of Things, or they would also say if they include the person into the picture, they call it the Internet of Everything, IOE. So what is the driving force of IoT or the Internet of Everything, IOE? These are the sensors. Now, okay, so previously I 
pointed out that one of the challenges of uh, wearable technology is power. And this is quite a lot of challenge. But you'd be surprised that electronic components nowadays, uh, even somewhere in Taiwan, they're building um, electronic components that dissipate 1 times 10 to the negative 9 watts. It's like saying the component doesn't dissipate any electricity at all or power. So they are now going towards ultra low power components in the nanowatt range. And still, it's not over yet. It's still going to go down even smaller. Now, you have microcontrollers that are really getting smaller and smaller without sacrificing functionality. And you know, for the students, there are several microcontrollers that can be bought nowadays. Um, there are those that incorporate even sensors with them and also wireless connectivity. And then here comes the conformal issue, which is solved by flexible electronics. I mean, they use a flexible PCB, as you can see on the upper right, and, um, and cloud computing. But actually, the aspect of cloud computing, where, where, for example, you have a sensor worn somewhere in your body, collects data and then wireless it will transmit data into the net and then transmit to the net and there is going to be a cloud of, a cloud or a set of computers that does the computing well let me tell you that that was before now they want to bring it back i mean the computing power back to the sensor itself or the module that we wear and you will call that later on edge AI. So I, I shall show that later on. So the challenges, well, are actually being solved uh, in a fast way. How is it possible? Because of technology. So there are actually several wearable devices and most of them uh, provide for you connectivity wirelessly to the internet or you can say that these sensors that you wear are interconnected to each other forming something called a body area network okay so every anything that you see that says it is smart you can see from the rightmost side smart finger smart ring smart belt the word smart is just telling you that it is able to send something it is not passive. It's not like the watch is just there and providing me measure of time, but rather it is actually providing me measurements of some biomarker in my body. Now, moving forward, well, these are common uh, commercially available wearable devices. I, I bet you are aware of Fitbit. There's also Misfit. There's also some glucose meters, Apple Watches, Google Glasses, all of them have connectivity even to your mobile phone or even to the cloud. For what purpose? Well, you can imagine that these sensors try to collect real-time data, pass it on to the cloud to do the computation and for creating the database. So moving forward, this is what I'm trying to mention. You know, IoT allowed us to have several of these sensors put in different devices or even in our clothing to become a wearable. And where is the computation happening? They call it the cloud or the data center. You connect it to the internet, then the internet is actually hosting a lot of these cloud or data centers that are very powerful supercomputers uh, that does the computation. But there's a bottleneck to that. Bottleneck is if you don't have any internet access, you might as well not be able to connect to the cloud and do the computation. And that would be very important, especially for people living in the remote areas where there is no internet access. Hence, the idea of putting back 
all of this computation to the device or the wearable devices is the direction of research. It's called edge computing. Why is it called edge computing? Because at the edge of this uh, pyramid that you see are the, are the devices which ha have more intelligence. So that are able to do computation by themselves. Okay. Uh, a while ago, I mentioned something about the body area network, or you can call it the human intranet. Um, this idea came from UC Berkeley through Professor Rabbi. And you would notice that this person has a lot of these uh, readout circuits, a lot of these sensors embedded to the person, and then each of them will have wireless connectivity. So it's like saying, okay, um, my network is my body. So you have all of these sensor nodes communicating to each other, collecting real-time information. So the typical modes of communication would be, could be ultrasound, which is actually emerging, uh, wireless, or even wired. So, but there are actually challenges, again, um, on this uh, how do we try to uh, deploy this in large scale? Especially, what about power? Okay, so we will talk about that in a second. Now, moving forward, these are devices under research. You will see from the left, this is from MIT in the US, and um, it is getting um, physiological parameters on the ear for purposes of non-invasively or non-intrusively non obtaining blood pressure. So it's not anymore that I need a cuff that I put on my upper arm, then I inflate the cuff, and then I get some blood pressure readings. Uh, by the way, that is called auscultatory method. And in the future, you don't need that. And I'll tell you how it is going to be done. Then on, on your right, you will see, the, uh, remember this is built in somewhere in Korea. They embedded the, uh, micro, uh, the microcontroller as well as the accelerometer, three-dimensional accelerometer on the clothing. Plus they added power. And power is generated using thermoelectric effect. So it is actually thermal powered. So they harvest the temperature difference in the body and in the surrounding to create electricity. That is the main essence of TEG or thermoelectric generation. So that is one mechanism to have sustainable power for the wearable device. Now, of course, um, we want to get parameters from our body uh, in a chronic way. I mean, for long-term uh, purposes. We cannot always go to the lab to get samples of our blood, then do the analysis, which usually takes uh, about a week to render the results. There are, there are now uh, technologies that try to um, utilize something excreted by the body in the form of sweat. And let me put a disclaimer that, um, well, sweat is not just things that people try to measure nowadays, even the tears, even saliva, even the pee or the urine. So in the uh, wearable sweat um, analysis. So you will see a couple of devices over here. Those are microfluidic channels on the, on the upper left. And then you will see on the lower right uh, sensors that indicate the presence or the quantity or the amount of concentration of some analytes like lactate, chloride, glucose, and pH. So 
the picture on the lower right, you will call it colorimetric sensing. From the name colorimetric, it tells you that the uh, amount of concentration of what you want to measure changes the color. Okay, so it's going to be translated as changes in color. Uh, if you will be aware, because um, this kind of concept has been here for ages, um, but that is mainly used for uh, assessment of urine components. So if you, you can take a look, it's called urine dipstick. Okay, so you can find it out later on. And then on the lower left, you will see uh, a device built in University of California in San Diego. It has uh, electronic components that are embedded onto the PCB, as you can see here. And then allowing some microfluidic channels. And then you will see the actual sensor. The sensor here is called screen printed electrodes because the sensor itself is printed on a film. Okay, so, and then on top of these sensors, there are actually enzymes that react with the sweat, spe specifically on the target analyte that you want to measure. So the right, lower right shows you colorimetric, where the amount of concentration I can write it here, colorimetric, where the amount of concentration is reflected as color changes. And the one on your right, on your lower left, is uh, electrochemical, where um, the concentration of the analyte that you want to measure is converted to either uh, current or voltage. And this kind of um, device or sensor is called screen printed and this is something that we can do nowadays so you can actually just try to print your sensors okay and then you can customize it i mean you can define what is the dimension of the of this and that will affect the sensitivity of the sensor so it's you can say that this is customizable and we're about to do that here in our university so you will see here some chambers you can call it microfluidics and uh, the design of them well this will need some uh, sophisticated uh, simulators 3d simulators so that you could be able to assess if the sweat does go out from this patch and so on and so forth. So this uh, uh, circuits are placed on a flexible PCB, flex PCB, and therefore it is uh, it can be worn. So moving forward, um, one company also. Um, develop their colorimetric sweat analyzer and um, while well, this particular patch you see on the upper on the top side is built by Gatorade and it tells you the amount of hydration or some would even try to put it for drug screening why is it so because there are uh, there are a lot of information that you can get from sweat. There are actually, maybe you can say you have lactate, you have um, glucose, you have potassium, you have sodium. Basically, sweat is a very complex solution. In, in our university, we are coming up with an artificial sweat solution, which we are trying to, uh, where we are trying to emulate sweat. Okay, so... And here you find uh, a device mounted. So the electronics are mounted onto a flexible PCB and conformal to some flexible microfluidic or material, you see here, and with some wireless 
features and sensing electronics. Okay, so, and even some mobile phone application. Okay, so moving forward. We actually joined the wearable sweat challenge. Um, we have a project which I invite the students as well for potential immersion later on with analog devices, which is a, um, a big uh, integrated circuit company. And, um, and also a university in Malaysia, which is University Technology Petronas. And recently we have partnership with Changgung University in Taiwan. So what is this doing? We want to measure lactate, glucose, sodium, and potassium, and also try to find its conductivity primarily to get a measure of the sweating rate. And also for compensation, we need temperature. And the participation of analog devices is to provide us with a high, uh, high performance chip that can interface through several electrochemical sensors and provide some digital outputs or even digital processing. Now, this project that we did, we're actually able to build the patch. We have analog devices for the sensor interface circuit. And now we are narrowing down to how do you measure the rate at which someone is perspiring or sweating. And we narrow it down to something called heating. So ter temperature difference across a certain channel gives us a measurement of the sweating rate. You see here a picture of a so-called screen printed electrode. Uh, it has three electrodes, namely counter, working, and reference. So this kind of electrode is said to be amperometric. Well, when you say amperometric, it only means that uh, I'm trying to measure amperes, which is current. So for amperometric kind of sensing, well, the current, the current from your sensor is proportional to the concentration N of the analyte. So the N is concentration. Maybe later on I can show you how this is being done. So if you have more time. Okay, so uh, amperometric sensing is the kind of sensing that is being deployed if ever you bought some glucose meter from some drugstore and so on and so forth. So what happens there is I try to fix a voltage across my working and reference electrode across here. They call it the potential stat. It's just constant voltage. And then I generate a current from the working electrode to the counter electrode. And that current is called I sense. And that I sense is proportional to concentration. So again, I apply a constant voltage across the working and reference. So I have a constant voltage over here. I will call this potential stat. If you, uh, potential stat comes from the word con uh, pot potential constant because it is going to be constant. Potential stat. And then there will be current from uh, working electrode, WE, until the counter electrode, CE. And that, and that current is proportional to the concentration. Okay, so moving forward, uh, this project is funded, by the way, by the DOSC Philippine Council for Health Research and Development. Don't worry, later on, I will to come back with the concept of amperometric sensing once you're able to see the circuit and how it works. It's going to be very easy. The other one is using a sensor called extended gate 
field effect transistor, which will be tackled later on as well. So moving forward, this is showing you what we're able to develop. Uh, we have the microfluidic patch using Kapton. Kapton is the yellow colored film. And notice that, okay, let me try to play this. Notice that we tried to put some uh, colored dye onto those very small circles. And that emulates uh, the sweat coming in. And notice that those dye, that the dye goes into the center. And the center is actually connected to the sensor. And then on your right, you will see variations in the temperature for different points on this heating patch. You see this uh, patch that looks like a flower here. So you have several points over here. And we try to map the different points on this patch and notice that at some time and at different flow rates, we do have a lot of significant differences of the temperature outputs for different flow rates and for different positions. We are on the process of calibrating this approach and hopefully you can come up with a good uh, publication for this. This is to show you a simulation using a 3D simulator where we introduce a heat pulse on this region and then notice how the heat pulse propagates across this channel. And the result is something that we see right here. So there is, so what is the general idea of this uh, slide? Well, there is a lot of potential of using temperature difference to get sweating rate. And, but why should we bother with sweating rate? Well, uh, the amount of sweat that is generated over time actually affects the amount of analytes that we measure. So if you have a lot of sweat, so you sweat a lot, so the tendency is for you to dilute the glucose, the lactate, and those analytes that you want to measure. So we need to compensate on the sweating rate. And we are able to do that by measuring the temperature difference. And moving forward, okay. Now, well, that is all about uh, wearable sweat detection. You also work on wearable fall detection. Why is it important? Well, Fall-related deaths in the U.S. is actually abysmal. I mean, it increases by 30%. And that was around five years ago. Can you imagine how about now? And also even in Malaysia, it is one of the reasons for the low survival rate, especially for the elderly. So there are different ways to come up with a device for fall detection. I do remember that uh, Google Watch came up with a fall detection and alarming system and so on and so forth. So the general idea is um, I need to detect the fall and then issue the alarm to a nearby health facility so that there will be um, the response will be uh, rapid. That's the idea. Now, Moving forward, we are actually joined this wearable fall detection challenge, but with some additional feature. You see, detecting fall is very hard because if you base it mainly on devices that measure your acceleration and your angle, well, that could actually, uh, that, those kinds of data that you generate from falling based from your acceleration or angular momentum could just be generated 
if you are moving, if you are sitting down, and so on and so forth. You call them activities of daily living. They tend to, um, they tend to uh, mask um, the actual fall because they tend to have the same sets of data. So that's the challenge. How do you tell the machine or the microcontroller that what it was able to observe is a valid fall? Or maybe because I just, I just swing my arm or I just sit down and so on and so forth. That's a challenge. So it will involve, therefore, some artificial intelligence or machine learning. And we're trying to do that as well. So on top of the fall detection, we also included some um, aspects. Specifically, we want to measure the blood pressure, but non-intrusively, non not using the cuff, and also to get measurement of heart rate or heart rate variability. And how will we be able to do that? Well, we are considering three uh, biological signals. I'll present that later on. So to give you a hint, it, it, these are your electrocardiogram, your ballistocardiogram, and your photoplethysmogram. Okay. Now, um, moving forward, we're actually trying to build this whole system with some wireless capability um, via the Wi-Fi. So you see, um, nowadays, devices or modules do not come, I mean, do not come separately. What do I mean? Before, when you buy a microcontroller, what you get is just a microcontroller. Nowadays, if you can see on the upper right, you have here a microcontroller that consists of a wireless interface uh, using Wi-Fi or even Bluetooth. And then it has the so-called IMU. Well, IMU would stand for uh, Inertial Measurement Unit. So IMU is Inertial Measurement Unit. Measurement. Okay, anything is a sensor based on inertia. And what are those kinds of sensors? Well, this includes a three-dimensional accelerometer, which I shall show you later on. And then you also have something that measures the angle or the gyroscope. You will see those later on. Okay. So where is the, on this picture, where is the uh, wireless interface? You have it here alongside with your accelerometers and gyroscopes. Your main microcontroller is just this, uh, this black uh, square. And then you have very small modules already available in the market and so on and so forth. So, I mentioned that previously we are considering using the three biological signals, or you can say biomarkers. We start with identifying them one by one. Ballistocardiography is actually, um, from the name itself, ballistics. Ballistics means it has something to do with the me something mechanical. So this ballistocardiography is actually uh, the mechanical activity of the heart. So for example, if you try to feel your heart, it is pumping. And the sensation that you feel is actually ballistocardiography. There are several methods to get that, but I want you to put your attention 
to the concept of using an accelerometer to get this ballistics of the heart or ballistics or the mechanical uh, response of your mechanical dynamics of your heart heart dynamics such that when you try to feel your heart you will feel some uh, that you feel that it is a beating or because it is pumping now okay uh, moving on well this is something that usually you can find in hospitals something that they put on the finger and then it has some wavelengths or colors like red it also has near infrared and recently they have green now um photoplethysmography tells you something about blood volume changes and what is the mechanism normally they say this is called reflective mainly because uh, you see I have an LED here trying to illuminate this part where there is a blood vessel running through and then since there is blood vessel that is there is blood passing through that vessel that blood is trying to reflect back the light coming from the led and this detector could could be uh, a photo transistor or it could be a photodiode or sometimes they want uh, to utilize a photoresistor or a light dependent resistor ldr but let me tell you that this is this stands for a uh, light dependent resistor now i just want to mention that if you want to try to choose the sensor for light which one should i use a photo transistor photo diode or light dependent resistor well if your application is just all about uh, change color your application is just all about switches i mean um if i want to shut off the circuit i just cover the light and it's off i would use the ldr now if i want to use it for optical fiber applications well i can use either photo transistor or photodiode so to be specific the, the detector used in optical fibers that gives us high speed internet is called the apd and that apd stands for avalanche photodiode now why is it called avalanche well a small amount of light energy hitting the surface of the diode gives a lot of current and that a lot of current notion is called avalanche so it's like if you go to uh, to the himalayas there's there's a lot of snow and ice and you're on a mountain so if you try to initiate uh a little you know you if you play around there and then you throw some snowballs there's a tendency for an avalanche to happen that's how sensitive these photodiodes are so for applications relating to ppg uh it's best 
to use either a photo transistor or a photo diode. I don't want to use a light dependent resistor. Why is it so? Why is it so? Because this is so nonlinear. Okay? So this is very nonlinear. And so I don't really get a very good, I won't get a very good profile like this. This could be smaller. Hence, because the photodiode does have high gain, or because it has very high sensitivity, well, they tend to utilize these sensors, I mean, photodiode and phototransistor, for purposes of PPG or even an optical fiber, rather than utilizing the light dependent resistor. Because the light dependent resistor is highly nonlinear, and this is mainly used for switches. Now, up until recently, you know, in, when you go to a medical facility, they utilize red colored light or something that you don't really see, the near infrared co color. But they have a problem. Their problem is if I, if I have a PPG device around my wrist and if I swing my wrist, I, have, I don't have any good signal anymore. This, these red and NIR, so red and NIR, are highly susceptible or are highly affected by motion artifacts. So they are highly affected by motion artifact. So you don't want to use this. So nowadays, they are looking at the green wavelength. If you're asking, why is it so that green will give me a better quality that is not affected by any movement or less affected by movement? Well, because green tends to have tends to be more penetrating because it tends to have a shorter wavelength than red and NIR. And therefore, it is not affected by the skin, not a lot as compared to red and NIR because it has more, uh, it can penetrate deep down through your vessels and not totally affected by the interface to the skin. So if you try PPG, it, must, it would be best to use green colored light because it has better penetration depth through your skin. And, um, and also utilize either a photodiode, a phototransistor for your sensor. And what will, what will you get is something like this. Picture on this. So you have an, a DC component. And then you have something that has pulses, or you say that it's AC component. Now, you see, um, the pulsatile component is coming from the arterial blood flow. And you have something that is, you can say this is the reference line that doesn't pulsate at all. You can say that it's the DC component. So, where do I get the systolic and diastolic pulses? See, the peak of these pulses in the AC component around here gives me the systolic. What is systolic? Well, that is when uh, there's high pressure. This now is diastolic. So from the plot of the PPG, I can locate systolic and diastolic events or systolic for high pressure diastolic for low pressure okay so moving forward so ppg is allowing us to get information on the blood volume changes okay and um, with this in fact you see since it is pulsating when you say pulsating, it seems to have a period. It's like, okay, I have, at this time, it's the peak 
systolic peak. And then after some time, and I have another systolic peak. I have some time duration, T. And you know, this T here, you can actually use it to get heart rate. Heart rate. In fact, nowadays, if you see something, a wearable device, a wrist-worn wearable device that uses light, well, it's just actually trying to find for you the time between these two systolic peaks and then the time over a minute. And that is called heart rate. Or they try to count how many systolic peaks are there over one minute. So it's just a counter detecting all of these peaks over one minute. And that's your heart rate. And how much does it vary? I mean, the count of the number of peaks per minute is called heart rate variability. So that's the essence. We are still not on to how to get the blood pressure. We're just still here uh, to get the heart rate. Blood pressure is another thing that's quite uh, a lot more difficult and sophisticated. So moving forward, the more common one is the electrocardiogram or elect for electrocardiography. Take note, if you remember, when we talk about BCG, it is the mechanical part or of the heart dynamics, the pumping. And then PPG now is blood volume changes. Now, what about, you see, the, the muscles in the body, in order for it to move, there has to be something called electrical stimulation to cause the body to have, uh, to cause the muscle to either contract or relax. So if you're asking, how does the heart pump blood or cause it uh, to cause the blood to flow? It's actually a sequence of portions of the heart contracting and then portions of the heart relaxing and vice versa. It's a sequence. And, those, and that sequence uh, are synchronized by a so-called sinus node, sinoatrial node. And that sinoatrial node generates the so-called electrocardiograph uh, signals. So the sinoatrial node causes the heart muscles to either polarize, that is, as I remember, that is to contract portions of the, of the heart muscles to cause it to contract and depolarize to cause it to relax. So if you're asking how can it polarize? So this is to relax. Mainly, these involve, these polarizations involve ion channels. Involves ions. Remember, for uh, ECG, it's more of ionic conductivity. Okay, so the end result of the sinus rhythm generated by this sinoatrial node causing portions of the heart to polarize and depolarize in a synchronized manner is the ECG. And you have from the ECG waveform, assuming this is normal, you can actually get different complexes or parts like the P, the R, the Q and S, and T. So um, what is normally obtained in typical instrumentation, let's say if I want to get, again, the most common one is heart rate. What you get is 
the interval between successive R's or peaks. So, if you see it this way, if I try to draw more of this, again, this is your R wave. This is your R peak. Okay. So what they do is to get the heart rate easily, you try to find how much time does it take for for you to have successive R peaks. And that amount of time actually translates to how many peaks are there. If, for example, I have one minute of observation time, and that gives you heart rate. So basically, what you do is try to extract how many are peaks in a minute. So you, know, you need to have a counter, you need to have a timer, and you need to have a detector. So for the detector, you can have something called comparator, and so on and so forth. Now, this is how they try to, again, what you can take away from this slide is ECG or electrocardiography refers to the electrical activity of the heart. And that electrical activity is actually a synchronized, uh, synchronized polarization or contraction or depolarization or relaxation of portions or, or of the heart muscles. And these occur ionically okay, using ion channels. Okay, so moving forward. Now there are several ECG instrumentation. Sometimes they say that these are the smart designs. Um, you see on the left, you have Cardio Defender from HTC. It it has even a mobile phone interface or something that has a tablet interface uh, from Apple and then something that was built by NASA a long time ago using 12 leads and then you have something done in Korea uh, single site I mean only in one location in the upper arm with some uh, mobile phone interface. So, by the way, I forgot, I'm not sure if it's here. I forgot to mention that um, there are several ways to get the ECG signal. Some of them, more accurately, they want to get the full picture of the ECG signal, so they need 12 electrodes. So 12 electrodes gives you the most accurate ECG signal representation that is mainly for diagnosis purposes. But there are uh, more reduced, more relaxed versions. There are already six electrodes. If you're not too picky or very particular about some of the signal components in your ECG, and even smaller, it's now three electrodes, and even two electrodes. Uh, why is it so? Why do they try to reduce the number of electrodes? Why does it go down to here? Guess what? That's because you want to make it wearable. Because the idea of wearable devices is I can just wear it, leave it, within myself, and then it continues to provision or get data. So now it's just but two electrodes. But there are actually challenges. So, okay, moving forward. Um, on the aspect of cuffless blood pressure measurement, the 
thing that they want to obtain that correlates well with blood pressure is something called pulse transit time. You will notice here that there are several two sample works that try to show us a correlation of the MAP. By the way, MAP stands for mean arterial pressure. So this is called mean arterial pressure. Okay. Is the average of the high pressure or the systolic pressure and the diastolic pressure. So this is your average systolic. This is the high blood pressure level and diastolic or the low or when the heart is relaxed, blood pressure, pressures. So if you have, let's say a blood pressure apparatus, Sometimes they will say, ah, your blood pressure is like 120 over 80. This is when the heart, this is called systolic, and the other one is called diastolic. Diastolic is when your heart is relaxed. Systolic is when your heart is stressed or it's uh, under high pressure. You know, just to mention, uh, my doctor told me that for information of everybody, this is this is not really good. This is pre-hypertensive already, pre-hypertension. And the normal range acceptable is had to be around 100 over 60. This is the normal range. So just for you to, to hear about this. And I want to say that what tries to regulate the blood pressure? The blood pressure is regulated by your kidneys. Okay, so moving forward. Um, the main mechanism for, for me not to use any more of an inflatable cuff that I put to my upper arm is to use a pulse transit time. The pulse transit time is the time it takes for the pulse wave to travel from one end to the other. And you can say that this is current. Or this is uh, better, say this is um, time. So if for example, you have velocity is equal to distance over time. Right? So... Velocity is equal to distance over time. So if I try to rearrange it, you have time equals distance over velocity. And velocity is related to pressure. Because this is the one that initiates blood flow, blood pressure coming from the heart. And distance is your artery. How long is the artery? So you can actually get a good measure of the pressure and the time, or if you say that the time is called PTT, pulse transit time. So the question is, how do I measure this pulse transit time? If this, um, there are actually several ways, as shown here. You can either utilize the so-called J wave of the BCG signal, or sometimes it's also called the SCG, which stands for uh, seismo cardiography. Cardiography. From the name itself, seismocardiography. Seismo actually tells you something about earthquake. Or if you remember, you have a word called seismic. 
This is for earthquakes. It's like how much vibration. So this is, if you look at it here, you have these kinds of peaks. You can say that that's the J wave. So the distance between the two J waves, the J wave and the peak of the derivative, this is the derivative, uh, time-based derivative, PPG. So you can see the difference at this point. And then the J wave, this is called pulse transit time. Okay. The other one is if you have the R wave, and then again, you note the peak of the derivative of the PPG. So if you have a PPG signal, I take the derivative of that with respect to time. And then I try to find where is the peak over there. And then the distance between the R wave and the peak of the PPG derivative gives me the pulse transit time. And the other one is, so you have here ECG and you have here PPG. You have here on the right, you have SCG or BCG and PPG. But actually you can use uh, PPG alone. So you have two PPG modules. So you compare the peak of the PPG or you can compare the derivatives of the PPG signal to get the pulse transit time. So there are a lot of ways to get the pulse transit time and the pulse transit time allows you to measure the blood pressure or the mean arterial pressure non-invasively or non-intrusively. So when you say non-intrusive, it does not affect your everyday living. It is just worn. It doesn't bother you or it does not disturb you. But then again, it allows you to get data. So these are ways to get EPG, uh, to get MAP, or the mean arterial pressure. Now, what is our progress in this research? Well, we have a simple setup, as you can see from the lower right over here. And we have, we're able to really integrate into one microcontroller module with some wireless interface Wi-Fi, and then I have an ECG module, and then I have here a PPG module. We're actually in the process of fabricating it on, on a platform that we can wear on the upper arm. And then we are able to get some data. We have, this is the raw data. And then we do some filtering. So we're able to really locate these are wave peaks, which is the one that is very important. And on the left, we're even able to do a mobile phone interface. I can play that for you. So that is collecting real-time data logged to a mobile phone. And, you know, most often, um, we need to be very, uh, uh, how do I say, certain about what we are trying to get. Because, you know, the big problem, if you try to get signals from wearable devices, keep in mind that those signals are highly corrupted by noise. If you're asking what noise are you referring to, there are actually a lot of noise sources. Some noise sources, which I will point out later on, comes from the electronics themselves. Believe it or not, electronic components are noisy. What 
are other sources of noise? Well, something called motion artifact. So you see here, we tried to come up with a PPG module that we wore on that we wear on the wrist. And then we try to swing our arm and we get this signal. What happened? The PPG signal is this one. You see the periodicity. There are some waves coming in. But notice that this PPG signal seems to be riding on some large signal, the color blue. And this color blue is motion artifact. I tried to swing my arm while I'm trying to get provision data. So, even worse, this is just, you know, we just call it micro motion. I'm motion that, that are not too much. Very small motions like finger tapping, uh, arm swinging. The, this does not even involve running or exercising. Just very simple motion. We call it micro motion. See? The PPG signal is corrupted by the motion artifact. So we try to do some kind of active filtering. We achieve something like this. Not yet perfect, but notice that we're able to reduce the motion artifact. But then again, there are problems. Because how do I do, do I actually have <coughs> very good signal? I mean, if my sensor is outside, does it have good coupling of the light and the detector to my skin? Because as I move, or even if I perspire, the interface between the sensor and the light source, especially for PPG, changes. And that affects a lot. So there are actually a lot of challenges uh, for a wearable device, especially for something that uses light. So what I mean is, for example, is something like this on your upper right. So again, if this is my skin, and I have a light source. So it is emitting light towards my skin. It is light. Let's say I'm going to use uh, green color, green. And then uh, it had to be reflected. This is the reflected light. And this is what we are trying to detect. Now, you see, this is a very simple diagram, but notice that between the light source and the skin, if the person perspired, say this is sweat, what happens? So the interface between the, the skin and the light or the sensor changes because now you have something liquid like sweat. And what else? The skin could have, you know, it's not, the color is not homogeneous, not similar. So, the, melan uh, the color of the skin tends to affect even the amount of reflected light or even the wavelength of the reflect reflected light. So there are actually a lot of questions especially if you look at PPGs. So, moving forward, there's still a lot of room that we can work, work on on this kind of research. Now, moving forward. Oh, sorry. On the aspect of fall, we actually found one work by an engineer from analog devices in China, they utilize the IMU. Should you remember IMU again? That stands for 
inertial measurement unit. And that includes accelerometer, three-dimensional accelerometer, and something that measures angles or gyroscopes. Okay. So what can we get from here? Well, you see an IMU uh, allows you to also try to get to something like fall detection without the need for, um, for some high level machine learning or AI. But you should take note of four instances or so-called characteristic phases. These are free fall or weightlessness, impact, aftermath, and orientation change. So where are they? First one is free fall. And then you suddenly have a spike in the acceleration. By the way, um, IMU has um, three-dimensional accelerometers. Accelerometers. And these three-dimensional accelerometers, of course, you have here X, Y, and Z. So what they do here is to get the vector sum, which is mainly just the square root of the acceleration across the x, across the y, and across the z. This is the vector sum. So normally, they will take this. Okay, this is called your vector sum. That is represented as the color green. So what happens? So the system had to be able to identify weightlessness, that is phase one. And then a sudden spike, that is phase two. And then some weak motions or some non-responsiveness, which we, which we categorize as aftermath. And then notice that there is a change in the orientation. What do I mean? See, if you try to compare phase four, just here, and then phase three, notice that the color red is different. The color red is the y-axis, this color red trace. So it has moved from, if I try to extend it here, it has moved from this point of negative 256 towards this point. That is change in orientation. So according to this paper, it is possible to detect fall by using just an IMU that consists of three-dimensional accelerometers to detect a fall by just so that uh, the machine, the microcontroller should be sensitive enough to detect these four phases in a fall. And nowadays, microcontrollers are but getting more and more powerful in terms of their functionality. And moving forward. In our case, we try to work on that concept and we do some emulated fall and we're able to detect some falling events based on our emulation or simulation, but still we will be incorporating not just acceleration data as you see here, but also angular data using the gyroscope. So this could lead to something like this. And what is the benefit of that? The wearable device is independent, or sometimes you say autonomous. I mean, on itself, it can do detection. Okay, so 
It is self-sustained. It can do the detection by itself. No need to transfer to transmit wirelessly the data to a computer. The computer does the processing and transmits the data back to the wearable device. So the wearable device is that intelligent already to detect falling vents. And that is very good if you're talking about uh, off-home scenarios where there is no access to any computer, okay, or internet. Now, moving forward, um, our university does have partnership with analog devices for our master's program. The program is actually doing uh, more on microelectronics, so we do chip design or integrated circuit design. And um, you see here, our first batch did design something called the trans impedance amplifier for the PPG. When you say, by the way, when you say trans impedance, the input is current. Input is current. And output is voltage. Output is voltage. So here you have an input current passing through this resistor and an output voltage being generated. That is called trans impedance. Also, you have something called low dropout regulator, which gives me even better than a battery because this gives me a constant voltage, whatever happens. What do I mean, so, what do I mean by whatever happens? If my temperature increases, the voltage is still the same. If my battery, the one I use to power my, my chip, goes down its voltage, then the voltage is still the same. So that's called a low dropout regulator. And then something that does the modulation, spe specifically for analog to digital conversion, it's called the sigma delta modulator. So, and then something for interfacing with an ECG, we have something called current balancing IA, which stands for instrumentation amplifier, which you will see later on. Instrumentation amplifier, and mainly for ECG extraction or biopotential readout circuit. Okay, so. We are, we are actually aiming at combining all of these four components into one integrated circuit the size of about not more than 1.5 by 1.5 square millimeters. That is highly possible. So moving forward, um, usually when you say wearable device, wearable technology, the normal thing that we remember is something that we wear around my wrist or sometimes the clothing has some sensors within it. So I call it smart clothing. Sometimes it's in the shoes and uh, so on and so forth. But actually, wearable technologies even uh, go into technologies for the blind. And you will see here glasses to try to help a blind person to somewhat have a visual perception of the environment. And this is mainly being done in Monash University in Australia. And what they do is, of course, they have the, the wearable glass, which has some camera with some transmitters. And then what happens is, this device, if I look at, at the back, oh, okay, so this device has some transmitters with embedded to it. And then at the back of the eye of the person, you have some electronic units with coupled with some electrodes at the back of the eye that provides electrical stimulation based on the signals obtained by the camera. So, you have a camera here, and then, of course, 
the idea of, or if you're asking, how do we really see? Well, we see because light is being reflected by the object. So that light reflected by the object goes to the camera, which is around here. And then that camera tries to digitize that reflected light in two dimension. And then the digitized signals are coupled wirelessly through the implanted electrodes onto the eyes or even to the brain, which is shown by here, done in Monash University in Australia. And for purposes of visual uh, perception, that's still considered a wearable device. And then uh, I bet uh, you, some of you may have already read about uh, mind-controlled gaming. In fact, there is such a device in the market called NeuroSky. And this is mainly used for mind-controlled gaming. Mind-controlled gaming. So you don't need to move your arms or legs. Just think about uh, how to move the object or character via your mind. And this is shown here. So it consists of several electrodes. Actually, if I'm not mistaken, you just need four electrodes on these specific parts of the head, which is mainly, um, uh, how do I say? They are mainly the uh, centers or segments in the brain associated with vision and some uh, motion cortices. So, but then again, we just don't want to utilize this for gaming. In fact, we can use it for something called BMI or brain machine interface. So what is this essence? Well, by thinking about uh, something, you're able to control a prosthetic. So this is a uh, prosthetic. This is going to be very useful, especially for people who are compromised. I mean, cannot move because for cases like, you know, there is a disease called locked-in syndrome. Locked-in syndrome. Where the person cannot move any part of their body, but the person is alive. The brain is alive, but there is no transmission of impulses from the brain through the spinal column, through the muscle. So what happens is the person is said to be trapped in his brain. So how do we try to solve that in an electronic perspective? We try to look into brain machine interface. And that is being done as we speak. Or you can say that this is neural rehabilitation, engineering. And also wearable devices allows you to have um, something called the exoskeleton. It, it's actually used to support the physically compromised. For example, it, for the elderly, uh, I was actually able to see a video of an elderly person being able to carry a bed or even climb stairs using these exoskeletons. And, and still, you can say they are wearable devices because you wear them for support. How do they work? Well, notice that you have four sensors. You have their interfaces. And these interfaces tend to detect something called detects uh, something called EMG or SEMG. Remember that um, this SEMG will stand for surface. Electromyograph or electromyography, 
when you talk about myography, you talk about muscle. And electromyography tells you about electrical stimulation of the muscle. Electrical, uh, electrical stimulation of the muscle. Or um, you can say that these are the signals coming from the brain to cause the muscle to either de be polarized or depolarize or to contract or to, re to relax. So we try to get, you see, how does the brain communicate to the body, especially to the muscles? Okay, so the brain will send an electrical signal towards the spinal cord, uh, spinal cord and then the spinal cord connects to some uh, fibers. And then the fibers go to the axons. And the axons ready try to transmit ionically signals towards the muscle, causing them to either relax or contract. It's actually mainly a transfer of potassium or sodium ions to the axons that are connected by the nerves to the muscles. So this is exoskeleton. Now, um, to, uh, to somewhat try to appease with, uh, to make it more aesthetic, I mean appealing, especially for the youth, wearable device even something like tattooed already so you can say it's it's like henna uh, but actually it's a sensor so you can see these so-called even bio stamps by a startup company in the u.s coming from the university of illinois so they created bio stamps that are actually sensors like things that try to measure blood pressure Things that try to measure amount of perspiration or what are the components in the sweat. And also things that try to monitor your body temperature or how long have you been exposed to UV or to sunlight. And they're coming up with several very nice tattoos that you can see over here. This is actually featured in IEEE Spectrum. And I provided the link below. So if you will be interested. Okay. Now, if you're asking, how are they able to, how do these tattoos or stamps able to uh, transmit data? You're able to transmit data whenever you see some concentric circles like this. And those are actually antennas. So they transmit via these antenna wirelessly. Or you can use this antenna for communication or for energy harvesting, which you shall see later on. So you can check out this work from University of Illinois concerning the temporary tattoo or a bio stamp as a wearable device. Moving forward, actually, you don't need stamp. You can actually go forward with printing it to your body. You can say it's called printable tattoo. You know, before this is not possible, the reason being, well, um, for you to really have a print like this so that the the design the patterns that you put here to adhere to, to an object you need a fairly high temperature but that fairly high temperature can cause some severe burns but up until recently uh, uh, researchers from Harbin Institute of Technology in collaboration with Pennsylvania State, they're able to come up with low temperature, high adherence uh, 
printing of conductive inks. So you will see here that they're able to print uh, patterns onto the skin. No need for stamps. So directly on the skin. Low, low temperature. And because of that, you can see from the bottom part, you can actually build PCBs or patterns to your skin. And notice that they tried it out. So they have a battery over here. And they print conductive traces, conductive traces. And then they're able to, conductive traces, and they're able to light up an LED. So see, you can now actually print, or you can say tattoo on the skin. No need for PCB. And this concept is being explored further to come up with displays. This is being done, uh, if I remember, it's from a university in Tokyo. So notice that even the electronic components like the LEDs are already mounted on something like plastic. So no need for PCB. Okay, so moving forward, I hope this uh, raised your interest on the concept of wearable technology. In fact, there are a lot. There are a lot of um, possibilities. You know, the limit is in your mind. So how do you now try to power the wearable? There are actually several ways to do that. And you can see here, could be piezoelectric. And this is something to do with um, motion. So that, okay, so if you look at the piezoelectric methodology here, you have a fixed cantilever. So this is a cantilever setup. And then the force applied to this mass here, tends to cause the piezoelectric material, which is this, tries to cause it to bend back and forth, or vibrate. And whenever you try to bend the piezoelectric material, you generate electricity. What about electromagnetic? Electromagnetic, well, the concept is purely defined by Faraday's law. And Faraday's law tells you something about electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetic induction. So for example, if you have shoes and below the shoes are magnets and coils, whenever the magnetic... So what does Faraday's law tell us? It's very simple. If you have a magnet, then suddenly... A loop of wire. So if you have a magnet like this, let's say north and then south poles. As you know, there is a magnetic field going this way by convention. So you have a magnetic field going this way. And then suddenly, you have A coil, a loop of wire or a coil, somewhere here. Let's say uh, this, these are loops of wires, wires, okay? Loops of wire, similar to what you see here. So whenever the loops of wire cuts the magnetic field lines, you generate electricity or electricity, which you call uh, EMF, electromotive force. And when you are able to get electricity, so long as the magnet gets closer or moves around relatively with the loops of wire or the reverse, 
So long as there's cutting of magnetic field lines, you are actually generating EMF or magnetic or electromotive force or electricity. So these are magnetic field lines and th that is governed by Faraday's law. And now you have a more common one, triboelectric. Well, this is temperature. Temperature. Long time ago, when I was still in Taiwan, I was able to see uh, an ECG device. So they are trying to build an ECG readout device that works on triboelectric effect. I mean, it gets its energy from temperature difference. And that is the main concept of triboelectric effect. It's actually... If there is a difference between the two uh, temperatures of these layers, let's say this is temperature one, and then the bottom part is temperature two. So do you have a delta T equal to, let's say, T2 minus T1, temperature difference or gradient. This is proportional to generated by this kind of... Uh, energy harvester so all you need to do is you have two layers this and this and they have two different temperatures the bottom one could be skin temperature the other one could be the surrounding temperature or something called ambient and then you have electric current and that is proportional to the temperature difference that is called triboelectric or temperature uh, thermal energy generation or TEG. And that's very common nowadays for a wearable device. And the other thing is using the same concept being done in RFIDs. And that involves RF energy harvesting. So what is the concept there is, okay, I have an RF generator. So it generates a frequency in the radio. It, it outputs radio frequency. And then you have, so you transmit radio frequency here. And then you have a receiving antenna that looks like this. It's just a bunch of coils. And then... They are matched, the two are matched. And because they are matched, you are actually able to get uh, the transmitted signal and try to even convert it into voltage or even upscale it. Upscale, which means you want to raise it up using so-called voltage multipliers. So sometimes you call it charge pumps. You try to raise the voltage and then you pass it on to your circuit and for whatever application that you need. So the key idea is I need an RF generator, then I need a, an antenna to transmit the RF signal and to receive the RF signal and then some matching networks and then some rectification and charge pump to raise the voltage and then pass it on to something that controls the power and to whatever you want to use it for. Like, for example, for uh, measuring ECG and so on and so forth. That is the essence of RF energy harvesting. Now, what's the beauty of that? You see, nowadays... We talk about Wi-Fi, we talk about Bluetooth. Those are actually RF signals. And because they are RF signals, well, so instead of trying to connect to the internet via the Wi-Fi, why not use the Wi-Fi signal to generate energy or electricity to get to try to power your devices? In fact, that is not a long shot. I would request you to look into 
inductive energy harvesting. That's the main concept. So for example, if you have uh, induction ovens, they call it induction ovens, that you use for cooking, but no fire involved, that is via inductive energy uh, harvesting. So mechanisms for powering the wearable, number one is due to motion. It's called piezoelectric effect, where when you try to bend this material, it generates electricity. The other way is by electromagnetic induction or by using electromagnetism, where you have either a fixed or moving magnet surrounded by a coil, and that's governed by Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. You can also try to look into temperature difference between the skin and the surrounding environment. This, that is called thermoelectric generation or TEG. Or you can use RF energy harvesting. Uh, you can use the surrounding or ambient Wi-Fi or Bluetooth signal not to connect but to actually generate electricity. And that is being done maybe for the last three to five years. So, powering the wearable. Now, we don't want to end with wearable because, of course, you want to even go implantable. Okay. Now, we know already pacemakers. That is to try to uh, support the... Uh, electrical activities of the heart, providing the, um, uh, the pacing signals to cause one region of the heart to contract and to relax in, in a synchronous manner to cause the blood, to cause it to pump. There are other implantable devices. The thing that is used for Parkinson's disease, that, that which you call deep brain stimulations. So you have a neurostimulator, you have something like a pacemaker to stimulate the heart and to stimulate the brain. And also device that you try to put into the brain to relieve of the pressure in the brain that causes something called hydrocephalus to something that sucks out the fluid in the brain, the extra CSF, to cause the brain to relax or to reduce its pressure. It's called shunt. Now, these devices need to be improved to make it smarter. So again, when you say the device becomes smarter, well, it is able to sense that um, there is already a lot of fluid in the brain, as in the case of hydrocephalus. So the shunt will try to operate by controlling the amount of flow out of this tubing thereby controlling the amount of pressure in the brain inside here. Or for a DBS or deep brain stimulator, it tries to detect the uh, local field potentials in the brain and then tries to know if there are some anomalies there and then usher in or provide the necessary uh, amplitude and frequency of stimulation signals. Or a pacemaker that tries to adjust with the dynamics in the heart to usher or provide the necessary stimulation. So smarter system actually involves sensing or something called closed loop. That's why you have smart implantables. Um, remember there is a sensor and the sensor involves some probes or electrodes and then it tries to measure some signals, specifically in this case, uh, local field potential in the brain, and then tries to pass it on through an implantable electronic device that provides a corresponding stimulation. Okay, so, so quick pause. Thank <laughs> you.
and also some works are actually doing something like for neuroprosthesis for assisted urination i mean sometimes especially if you are hit by stroke you don't have even control for you to urinate or pee so this device tries to sense the electrical signals onto the mask onto the uh, onto the excretory system onto the nerve endings and if it is able to sense that the bladder is full already it will now try to usher in some electrical signals to cause the bladder muscle to contract and relax causing it to pee these are implantable devices now those implantable devices seem to be very large and they tend to be a little bit uh, they tend to be a little bit invasive that is why researchers in the university of california in berkeley with the so called neural dust the neural dust is a brain machine interface so generally speaking you see these very small specks of dust here those are actually sensor nodes very very small sensor nodes with some wireless connectivity via a transceiver using ultrasound and then transmitting over here using ultrasound and the circuit trail would look like this technically speaking you have your transducer that which generates electricity from something physical like movement like temperature and so on and so forth you generate electricity you try to make it constant via rectifier without some regulators then passing on through your signal conditioning circuits and then communications so they are able to build this and uh, i suppose they are trying to uh, test it on real samples they call it the neural dust and in relation to this neural dust also even led to uh, wireless backless implantable sensors for improved brain control and they tried it on mice and that they use it on the mice muscle and the concept is they try to utilize the concept of back scattering where the blue traces they transmit ultrasound waves and then that hits the dust or the sensor and reflects back a signal that tells you about the the condition of this muscle either may it be strained or relaxed and then it is being processed by the circuit okay so this is called stimulator dust why is it called dust because it's very very small i suppose this is maybe a couple of millimeters so what is happening here is okay they have the power source using a piezoelectric device and they have a stimulator and some electronic components like capacitor so it encircles a nerve so that um, when the nerve is not functioning properly all you need to do is transmit the signal towards the stimulator ic so as to cause the nerve to pass some electric electrical signal this is called stim dust being done in uc berkeley okay so possibly in the nearest future you would see something like this this is from a movie popular for the youth uh, around three years ago uh iron man uh say remember this is avengers uh infinity war this is possible if you remember this movie they talk about nanotechnology and that's highly possible that's why there's gonna be a demarcation line or an intersection intersecting point between fiction and reality and to be continued with this because later on it's gonna be invisible devices that ends section one of this talk Perhaps 
is there any question with regards to first part? Baik kepada peserta, apakah ada yang ingin bertanya? Any question, participants can type your question in the chat column. Or raise hand, maybe. <coughs> Chat column or raise hand. Okay, I saw a question. For wearable gadgets, what kind of batteries must be used? Um, normally, they will use lithium polymer, LIPO, or even the lithium ion battery. That will still be fine. Okay, okay thank you, Mr. Silvio. Uh, my name is Budi. I'm a uh, lecturer at, at Majaya Catholic University, but I'm not in the field of medical electronic like you. <laughs> I am in the uh, field of power engineering yeah, and control. But I am, uh, uh, your lecture is very interesting for me. Yeah? And for the wearable uh, gadgets such as uh, do you, you have mentioned the BioStamp. Where uh, the, uh, do the BioStamps get power? Through the an antenna? Oh, OK. okay. Yes, sir. I will go back to that slide. Yes, because uh, maybe it, it can be used for uh, to implant chips on the person. So uh, we don't have to uh, bring along our credit card, just uh, a certain chip that is implanted in our hands or in our skin, uh, beneath the skin. Yes, sir. Actually, sir, um, sir Budi, you, you're right to say that um, it's, it's via RF. In fact, uh, you will notice here, sir, it's, it is quite small. This is NFC. Uh, they're using near field communications for mm. not for communicating, but for harvesting energy. So you're right to say that it's from RF, near field. they are using for this so in the uh, future maybe we don't have to uh, bring along our, our id card just implant some chips in beneath our skin is it right like that yes sir that's highly possible uh, so that, it's actually sir the same concept like RFID. Uh, for RFID, uh, yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. Yes. Uh, oh, so it is uh, like RFID. Yeah, yeah. Because this is the uh, development of RFID. I think. Yes, sir. Is it correct? Yes, sir. Uh, based on your uh, presentation. Uh, I see that that for the students, it is very important to understand physics, and uh, uh, because all you have uh, given to us is based on physics. Is it right, Mr. Sapiavio? I think um, some basic physics, like uh, for instance. Uh, 
where is it? Okay. Yes, you, you have mentioned five days law. Yeah. yeah? Yes. Mm. Oh, not this. Uh, oh, sorry. And uh, uh, yeah. one thing, one other thing. You have yeah. mentioned uh, I am you. What is the principles of operation of I am you? Oh. Yes, a, a few a strain gates or something like that. Uh, I can show. Actually, I have part two of this session. I want to show it. Uh, it's actually, you can imagine something like this. Okay, I will show you the, some part of my next discussion. Uh, you can see this. Yes. So the question is all about what are these IMUs? So basically, they consist of accelerometers, three dimension, and gyroscope. Uh, they're called inertial. I mean, inertial, because they involve a suspended mass. Mm. So for accelerometer, um, you can see there are actually one and a set of fingers. And uh, the main uh, sensing mechanism is as this movable mass goes from, let's say, from left to right, from, let's say, going to this side. So these fingers, these small fingers here, and these other fingers over there actually create a capacitance. Mm -hmm. If I try to draw it again, for example, I have, let's say, finger one, and then I have another one here. Uh, finger two and let's say that finger one is fixed it's not moving and the other one is moving so this is movable so as i'm moving actually what happens here is uh, i do create a capacitor see now for the students, please do remember that uh, capacitor has a value that looks like this. Epsilon, permittivity, cross-sectional area over distance. And um, if you fix the area and the permittivity of the uh, dielectric, then the capacitance is a function of distance. So if you have a simple top plate or oh, plate capacitor like this. So long as you have an insulator or something called dielectric, also known as insulator, and you have conductors, so this you have a conductor here or plate. So long as two conductors uh, sandwiching a dielectric or an insulator, you create a capacitor. So the concept mm -hmm. of capacitor, um, you have here the area of this plate, area, or overlap, and then you have the uh, distance between the two plates, D, and whatever mm -hmm. insulator you have in between. So for accelerometers, it's basically... As my movable finger goes closer and closer to the fixed, I'm actually trying to change the distance. So originally, for example, you have this distance. And because the cap overall capacitance is affected by distance, so as my distance decreases, so th say this is, this is one and this is, this is number two. So now the resulting capacitor out of here is, say that is C2. It's actually, if this is originally C sub 1, so this is greater than C sub 1. Mm -hmm. And if you know the mass, which is normally obtained, and if you know the displacement, 
you actually have a measure of speed and likewise acceleration. So by, by the change in the distance, which is translated to change in capacitance, if we remember that um, force is equal to mass acceleration, and if I would know the force based on the amount of deflection I have, because these, I, these movable seismic mass is attached onto a spring, and that creates some force. So if I, I can get the force, and I know the mass is fixed, I can get acceleration. And the force is proportional to the capacitance change, delta C, which is proportional to distance. So distance translates to capacitance, translates to force applied on the spring, on the movable seismic mass. And from there, you get acceleration. But generally, you just need to get change in capacitance in the same way as a gyroscope. So they're actually, sometimes they would say are interchangeable. Okay, I understand. Uh, thanks for your clear uh, explanation. Yes. Um, these things, by the way, uh, are built using MEMS technology. And MEMS will stand for Micro Electromechanical System. Mm -hmm. And um, they have a lot of potential application like this. It has several components called microactuators, like the gears, microsensors, uh, like you, the one I showed you, the accelerometer, microelectronics. Well, that's the the operational amplifier, the uh, corresponding filters, etc., and some microstructures like this. So sometimes they will use it for imaging like this. So you can imagine that these are lenses, lenses or mirrors. So they use it on cameras for primarily for focusing and so on and so forth. So these are, MEMS would stand for micro electromechanical systems. It's like your overall system, the size of millimeters. Mm -hmm. They try to reduce everything on millimeter scale or even micrometer scale. And um, I want to mention that this concept is driven by the so-called more than more or beyond more because uh, in microelectronics, they have the concept called Moore's law and the idea of Moore's law is the number of transistors on a chip doubles by 18 months. So the number of transistors, mm -hmm. because they become smaller and smaller through time, will double for every 18 months. This was created by uh, Gordon Moore from one of the forefronts or founders of Intel for every, oops, sorry, 18 months. Why is it so that for the same area, I will have more transistors? The idea of Mursto is make the transistor smaller. Especially for digital applications. That's why smaller. And when we talk about how small they are, in Taiwan nowadays, the, the size is just around 2 nanometers. That's small. But then again, there are a lot of issues. Uh, maybe next time we can talk about those issues. Because if it's very, very small, it's very hard to control. But in Taiwan, in the uh, research phase, in their national universities, they work on two nanometers, the high end. Now, 
what does more than more tell us? Because Moore's Law is mainly digital. I mean, when you talk about digital circuits, they you refer to processors, uh, memory elements, and so on and so forth. So they try to make the transistor smaller and smaller and smaller through the years, reaching about two nanometers, so that they can have more processing power. It's like saying, for the same area, you have more uh, soldiers that can do computation, or you can have more memory. That's why there is such an explosion of memory density from a couple of 256 uh, megabytes, which I, uh, I had before, one, 128 MB, if I'm not mistaken. And now it's terabytes, and then the size is not too big. So why is it possible? Because technology-wise, they reduce the transistor size by two for every 18 months. So from, let's say, a size of um, 180 nanometers, they are able to shrink it down to two nanometers. But there are a lot of problems. It's very hard to control. Therefore, since they cannot scale it anymore, they cannot make it smaller and smaller and smaller because it's very hard to control, they come up with the idea of more than more. And more than more is telling us that the chip is not just all digital, but rather it has analog. It has components like passives, which include resistors and capac resistors, capacitors, and inductors. Okay. And inductors. And some high power, high voltage components, especially for power electronics and some sensors, actuators, and even biochips. So the key idea of more than more is diversification, which means you are able to incorporate more functionality on a chip the size of maybe 2.5 by 2.5 square millimeter, incorporating sensors like MEMS and op amps for analog or RF transceivers, or even components like resistors, capacitors, and, or inductors. So that's the concept of more than more, which led to the concept of something you call system on a chip. Or you say that is SOC. And that is quite boring already nowadays because uh, they are able to come up with lab on a chip. And that is also boring already because now they are lo looking into organ on chip. And what is the driving force be behind organ on chip? A mix of microfluidics and microelectronics. So that is the concept of more than more, which is beyond more, which tells us that um, on a chip, we don't need to make the transistor very, very small so that we can have better processors or faster processors or more memory elements. We try to utilize it for other application like sensing, like uh, filtering or amplification or transceivers or controlling power or even biochips. It's called more than more. And that paved the way to the creation of MEMS devices on a chip. So just to show you, the, uh, this, is, this I got from analog devices. Nowadays, um, when you talk about system on a chip, it had to have the following signal chain. So the first part will involve technically a sensor, could be MEMS, or it could be solid state or solid state. I mean, typical sensors built on semiconductor devices. And you have some uh, conditioning and then driving, which involves digital to, an digital to analog converters 
the amplifiers. Condition and acquire, this will involve analog to digital com uh, converters. On top of that, you must have some voltage references, which will provide uh, bias voltages so that your components would properly work. And so all of these things form your so-called system on a chip. Now, this is necessary in most components, especially if you want to come up with a wearable device. But then again, uh, most wearable device chips already incorporate most of these blocks. So that's why you have a system on chip. What is lacking here is, where do you get the power? And then again, the power could be obtained by either thermally, electromagnetically, via induction using RF, via motion using piezoelectricity. And so, these are your typical sensors. Oh, by the way, the, this last session is all about sensors and actuators, which are enablers for smart devices. Mm. And moving forward, we have several kinds of sensors. This, this is referred to as semiconductor sensors. Um, you see here, it's called FET-based sensors. Uh, specifically, these are called ion-sensitive field effect sensors. Ion-sensitive field effect sensors. Where their electrical parameters or uh, their electrical parameters are modulated by some analyte that you that they are in uh, that they are in contact with. So they technically they change these kinds of sensors change their turn turn on voltage. Sometimes they change their so called threshold voltage in response to the concentration of the analyte that they're exposed to. For example, hydrogen. So the amount of hydrogen tends to change the turn-on voltage or threshold voltage of these sensors. And so if you want to try to use these sensors, you must actually get the threshold voltage difference. What I mean is if I try to plot in two dimension, so if this is uh, VTH, threshold voltage of these transistors, then, oh wait, so this had to be, sorry, had to be concentration. Oh wait, uh, this had to be voltage, this had to be current. So if I have a certain IV curve for my sensor, so for example, I have this plot. This is for concentration one. And then I try to increase the concentration. I have the following. This is for concentration number two. And then I have the following. This is going to be for concentration number three. And notice that there are points that you can notice over here. See that the x-axis is voltage. The y-axis is current. So we're referring to IV curve. So the, the device itself needs a certain voltage so that you can have a sudden rise of current. And you call these voltages over here threshold. VTH. So what is happening here is N refers to concentration. So N is concentration. So what can you notice is for the same sensor, its IV curve tends to shift to the right when you have, for example, increasing concentration. And 
actually what is changing is the turn on voltage or the threshold voltage. So by detecting the threshold voltage, you're actually able to get the concentration. So if I try to plot now uh, on here, so for example, I have concentration N, then I have your VTH. I'm going to have something that looks like this. N is concentration. Straight line. Because for every uh, for every concentration, I have a corresponding voltage or threshold voltage. Again, the threshold voltage is reflected as the, the amount of voltage needed to, to actually have a large amount of current. Or you can say uh, this is a turn on voltage. So the, the, that is the concept of FET-based sensors. Their method is via threshold voltage change. So actually, you can use this uh, to measure analytes in the sweat, or even on the tears, or even in the urine. OK, so moving forward, this is what I mentioned a while ago. Accelerometers plus gyroscope create your inertial measurement units. Um, how do you try to interface these sensors? Basically, it's more of op-amps. For example, you have your difference amplifier. And sometimes you would need an integrator because um, where, where will you use an integrator? What if, you see, I mentioned for an accelerometer, what I'm actually trying to sense, the sensing mechanism is capacitance. So why not this capacitor at the feedback of my op-amp is my sensor? And what will happen? The output voltage is something like this. So see, V out, and the capacitance is inversely proportional. 1 over C. This is very linear. So if I try to change this capacitor to a sensor, I'm actually integrating using the sensor capacitance. And that is fairly linear. OK, so later on, I will point out a more sophisticated circuit for the difference amplifier. Okay, so, and then if you have a uh, integrator, you have a capacitor, uh, a differentiator, the reverse. So then again, if I replace this with a capa with a sensor, let's say this is C sense. So this is now linearly related. So V out is proportional to C. If that is sensor, so I can generally get um, the capacitance out of my output voltage. And then you have a trans impedance amplifier. For example, your sensor is a photodiode. And then the amount of light hitting my photodiode is because of, maybe because of the PPG, reflected PPG signal. So what happens is the current through my photodiode goes here to generate an output voltage proportional to the current, the photodiode current. So I have V out proportional to the photodiode current. And this is a sample of a photodiode. So, by the way, this is called transimpedance amplifier because um, your output is voltage, V out, and your input is current. So, 
your output over input is voltage over current and voltage over current generally equates to letter Z or impedance in general. Well, again, impedance uh, refers to many things like uh, resistance, reactance, especially if you have capacitors or inductors, and so on and so forth. So these are typical... Um, sensor interfacing circuit. I suppose the next slide is, I want to show you very quickly how to get transfer function of op-amp circuit. And I hope this is something that you will remember uh, even as you go into your uh, careers later on. So generally, it's gonna be very easy. Okay, so one thing we need to agree on the concept of nodal uh, equation. Ah uh, no, I I better write it like nodal analysis. Nodal analysis. It is very easy. So, what does it mean? For example, if you have a resistor, you have A, you have B, and you have a resistor, and then at voltage. At A, you have a certain voltage at node A, and then you have a certain voltage at node B. Of course, you have a potential difference. Therefore, you have a current, I. So by nodal analysis, you're actually trying to represent the current by the voltage difference across the resistor. So by Ohm's law, you know that I is equal to VA minus VB over R. Okay, so this is nodal analysis. Now, if you look at an op amp, generally there's a term called virtual ground. So, if it is a virtual ground, what does it mean? So, for example, in an operational amplifier, you have something like this. And this is called non-inverting input and inverting input. Now, the voltage here let's say, in positive, and then the voltage at the negative. Because you have a virtual ground, those two are equal. And that is called virtual ground. What else? So this is item one for op-amps. If you try to move again here, still op-amps, Remember that an op-amp has virtual ground and therefore it has a high input impedance. So if it, has, if, if it has a high input impedance, what does that mean? So if you try to draw the op-amp like this, that's positive, that's negative. Then if I try to have an input like this. And then you have your V in positive here and V in negative. This Z in or impede, input impedance is going to be very large. Z in is very, very large. If you want a figure or a number for this, this is maybe giga ohm range. That's very large. So, if that is very large, if you follow this current, and if VA is V in positive and VB is V in negative, so if you have a very large R in, what happens? The current is zero. 
I in is zero. And because I in is zero, as a consequent as a consequence, V in P is equal to V in N. So just two things that students should remember, nodal analysis and V in positive is equal to V in negative. Now, if you try to come up with very basic, uh, let's try an integrator. So for an integrator, please remember that there is a conversion. For example, if you have a capacitor C, its value is 1 over uh, SC. If you have an inductor, that is SL. S is Laplace operator. Don't worry. Let's just try to obtain equations with this uh, operator. Yeah. So let's try an integrator. So the integrator would look like, if you remember, it looks like this. So you have capacitor at the feedback and you have a resistor. So how do you do that? Okay. So. So if you try to draw that, negative, positive, and then you have a capacitor at the feedback. You have a capacitor here, and then you have a resistor here, R, and then you have V in. Then you have here, let's say, ground and V out. What we do is, we assume that I have two currents. Okay, so one current, uh, one current going there, and one current going here, and another current going inside. So let's call this IF, because that is feedback current. This is I in. Uh, Okay, let's just call it I1, sorry. Let's call this I sub 1. And this is I in, the one going inside the up. So you have, if you know Kirchhoff's law, then you can say that uh, I in is equal to IF plus I1. Okay. Sometimes we will call this Kirchhoff's current law, KCL. After that, so let's now look at the node V in positive, which is this node. So at V in positive, you have, I mean, the KCL equation. So maybe I put it here instead. Okay, erase, erase, erase. Uh, I in is equal to I F plus I1. Now, we know that input current run up amp because of its very high input impedance or virtual ground is zero. So this had to be equal to zero. What, if, what is the value of IF? So if I write it again, so this is now IF plus I sub one is equal to zero. IF is by nodal analysis, this is V out minus V in positive on the positive node 
and then you have the value of, of C. So I previously noted here, C becomes one over SC, and this is like a resistor. And this is like a resistor. So I can write here one over SC. And then what about I sub one? That is V in minus V in positive divided by R. And then that equates to zero. So this is now equation one. Now, let's now look at, at V in negative. You see, oh, sorry. That, this had to be V in negative, sorry. Okay. So this is had to be V in negative. So this now is V in positive. So for V in positive, we're looking at here. What we get is V in positive is equal to zero because it's just grounded. So what else? Ah, okay, noted on the time. So very quickly. And we know that V in positive have to be equal always to V in negative. And so this is zero. So if this is equation number two, then all of those V in negative in equation one, if I put it back there, two on one, so what happens is V out times a little bit of algebra, you have SC, then plus V in over R is equal to zero. So this gives you V out is equal to negative V in over SCR. And you know, if you see S at the denominator, so the inverse Laplace of one over S is actually an integration. Therefore, this becomes negative V in over RC. Oh wait, sorry, negative. Negative one integral of v in times derivative of time. That's why this is an integrator. You can try changing the resistor to a capacitor and resistor to an integrator, noting that the inverse Laplace of S is actually a derivative. Moving forward, due to interest of time, one of the most uh, fundamental sensor interface is called the instrumentation amplifier. And it is being used for bridge type sensor applications, like for sensing the magnetic field and also for piezoelectric devices or chemiresistor devices. Okay, so why is it so? Because it does have a very high input impedance and a very high common mode rejection ratio. And very importantly, the gain is set by a single resistor. But it comes with the payoff. You see, R1, R1 should be exactly equal. R2 and R2 should be exactly equal. R3, R3 should be exactly equal. Otherwise, you will lose the common mode rejection ratio. Now, there are other uh, 
interfacing circuit for FET, which we call potentiometric sensors. Well, the idea is I want to fix the voltage across my sensor, and then I also fix the current. That is why you call this constant voltage and constant current circuit. And then once the voltage and current are constant, then the output would just be, again, a function of VTH, where VTH is proportional to concentration. Non-parametric sensor uh, interface circuits, well, what I do is generally I have a voltage here across my op amp and then across my reference electrode, I have a resulting voltage across my working electrode and reference electrode. I call it my potential stat a constant voltage. And then what happens is, depending on the concentration, I generate a certain I sense, which is proportional to the concentration of the analyte. And then this I sense is just copied to the other side. This is now I sense. And what happens is, you have a resistor by Ohm's law, you have a V out equal to VDD minus I sense times R out. So you have an output voltage, which is a function of I sense. So the key idea of amperometric sensing is we need to have a constant voltage across working and reference electrode. Then there's gonna be a current I sense, which is proportional to the concentration. Um, I just want to mention that due to the interest of time, circuits themselves have noise and offset. And if you're asking, where is the source of the offset and the noise. Well, the circuit itself generates noise. The typical spectrum of the noise on a circuit looks like this in terms of frequency. Um, what this tells us is the, the amplifier itself or whatever circuit you have contributes to noise. And the noise could either be offset or any drift. And the more dangerous one is called the 1 over F noise. They call it the flicker noise. It's because of the movement, the charges across the uh, surface of the semiconductor. And then white noise, which is present in all spectrum. Sometimes white noise is thermal noise. So these all happen because the movement of the charges is not laminar it's not just one straight line it is very uh random so you can learn more about that if you talk about the effect of electric field on the movement of the charges now where is offset coming from well for example if you have an op amp the ideal output voltage is zero if you try to short these two terminals together but what happens is it's not actually zero. So for me to have a zero output voltage, I need a certain VOS, and this is called offset. Where is offset coming from? Offset comes from the fact that if I have, for example, a differential amplifier like this, this is a difference amp, differential amp, this R1 and R2 ideally should be the same. But in actual fabrication, R1 and R2 are not actually the same. And so you have delta R. And because they're not the same, and at, at the same time, T1 and T2 are not exactly the same, so you are going to have a difference in current. And both of them contribute to offset. 
because they're not properly matched. So if you're asking, what can we do about this? Well, technically, the best designers cannot solve this problem just by trying to make them equal. So there are techniques. Maybe I can just introduce one. This is called chopper stabilization. So what is happening here? This is your amplifier. It is, your amplifier is called fully differential. And when you say fully differential, you have, uh, you have two inputs that are plus and minus, and you have two outputs that are plus and minus. What you do with chopper stabilization is, my input, for example, is a DC signal like this. I chop it. I try to sample it at a certain frequency. So the result is like this, the square wave black trace. Now what happens is offset of the amplifier comes in because the components in the amplifier cannot be perfectly matched because of some limitation in fabrication. So offset comes in. And then what happens is both the offset and the signal are amplified by a factor of A. So they grew bigger. And then what you do again is chop it. Sample it again at a certain frequency. What happens? The red trace, which is the offset, becomes a square wave signal. And then, you know, if you chop it again, if you chop a signal again, it actually goes back to its original form. That's why it's like this. Now, if your signal is pure DC, then the noise and all of those offsets in the amplifier itself is now modulated. Then all I need to do is, because this uh, signal, this red trace, which is noise and all of the offsets are high frequency, high frequency, all I need to do is filter it. That's why you have a low pass filter. So your signal is now amplified. And what happens to your noise or offset? It's now reduced. That's the concept. Double modulation and low pass filtering is the essence of chopper stabilization. In the frequency domain, finally, you can see the mechanism like this. For example, if this is the spectrum of your signal, after chopping, what happens is I try to move the frequency of my signal across my chopping frequency and you have harmonics, odd harmonics, and then the offset and noise, which looks like this dotted trace will add up. And what happens is after chopping again, these traces of modulated signals go back or they move back to this spectrum. And then the dotted lines, which represent the noise, move to higher frequencies, harmonics of the chopping frequency. And all I need to do is filter. And so you don't have any more noise. And that is called chopper stabilization. This is but one of those techniques that are used to remove noise and offset. Why would they be important? Because if you look at the spectrum of biopotential without circuits, you will see what I mean. If you talk about getting ECG or PPG or EMG or all of those Gs to refer to biopotential amplifiers, Top of the line, they are low frequency, very low frequency. And then number two, very low amplitude. And you see, where, is, where, is, where are all the noise in your amplifier, in your electronic component? They reside in the same bandwidth as your signal 
if I, if I again try to draw that, you see something like this. Y-axis is noise density. X-axis is frequency. It looks like it's dominant at low frequencies. Dominant at low frequencies. And fairly low at high frequencies. And where are your biological or biopotential circuit uh, signals residing? They are actually somewhere hidden inside this noise spectrum. So this is your, these are your biopotential signals. So see, if I'm not able to really reduce the noise and the offset of my readout circuits, let's say if I want to get ECG or PPG or whatsoever, I will actually lose that. I will just be amplifying the noise by itself. So those are challenges. I need to remove the noise. I need to remove the offset. Noise could be coming from the circuit itself or from the environment. Out of the line that you need to guard later on is the noise from power lines. In Philippines, it is 220 volts and 60 hertz. I'm not sure in Indonesia. And so because they're capacitive coupled to your readout circuit, so I need to remove that. and offsets, and I think that we also keep in mind for any readout circuit for a wearable device, it had to have low noise and low offset. And more importantly, it must have a very high rejection of ambient noise. Specifically, it must have a very high common mode rejection ratio because you see these signals coupled via the capacitors through my for example, ECG system, they are called common mode signals, which can be removed if I have a very high CMRR. And with that, thank you so much for your attention. There's but quite a lot of topics to cover, but maybe for next time, I'd like to show my last slide, which is very nice. Okay, so it seems to be very difficult, but we don't just give up from Stephen Hawking. And then thank you so much. So hope that I was able to share something significant. If you have questions, send me an email and so on and so forth. So just to show you that Philippines and Indonesia are good friends. In fact, you're truly as married to an Indonesian. Thank you. Thank you again, Mr. Fuyamu, for your interesting presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. Maybe, maybe Prof. Fuyamu have a, a certain closing words? Ah, nggak bisa. Ini ke Carolus aja, Carolus. Carolus? Yeah. Di chat, ada dua pertanyaan lagi ya? Bisa di ini enggak? Uh, uh, in the chat room, there are two questions, Mr. Sofiamio. Could you also answer these in the chat chat room? Ah, if the you, you I mean, Mr. Mikoyan, right? Uh, uh, yes, for Mikoyan. Okay, so uh, if something uh, to uh, that... the, the first question is from Mifflem. <laughs> Oh, yeah. sorry, 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 I dropped my keyboard. Okay, so if it can work normally. Uh, actually, remember they are dust. They're very small, so they can just be there. The size is uh, half a wavelength. And maybe one wavelength could give you that's going to be less than one millimeter. So it's, they are non-invasive. Um, you, your brain will not notice them. So it could stay there, I suppose. And what's the other question, sir? Yeah, the question is from... Uh, ah, Mikoyan. 
Ah, uh, Clifford. Yeah, uh, the other one is from Clifford. Is there a nun? Oh, okay. Okay, so Mr. Clifford, there is actually a way for BMI that is non-invasive. It actually, it actually uh, depends on the uh, how far you want to measure from the brain. Because, for example, if you want to measure uh, very close to the brain, we call it electrocorticography. So they have to be somewhat implanted because it is on the surface of the brain. <clears throat> But then again, please remember that the body is a conductor. And properties of conductor is such that all of the charges, like the signals from the brain or from the heart, they go to the surface. So not necessarily that they have to be implanted to achieve a BMI or brain-machine interface, but rather you can use the devices uh, used for gaming, like the one built by Neurosky, it is getting the EEG signals. So there are actually several signals you can use coming from the brain. The, the superficial one at the surface is called electroencephalogram. Uh, the other one going closer to the brain will be the electrocorticography, which is measuring directly on the skin sur on the surface of the brain. And the other one is trying to look at the local field potential, but that is uh, very invasive because you need to implant on the brain. That's why they come up with the neural dust. But there are, uh, you know, <clears throat> there are limit, there are constraints as well if you go far from the brain. Um, that constraint would be, well, you, you will have <clears throat> lower signal quality because you get farther from the brain. Remember, you need to be away from the brain. I mean, there's a skull. The skull tissue tends to reduce the signal quality as well. And of course, the, since I mentioned that the body is a conductor, and at the surface of the body, though we don't really feel it, there are so many charges. And so if you try to get signals from the surface of the skin, like if you use an electroencephalogram, um, you actually try to get other signals as well. So the signal quality becomes worse as you go away from the brain. But to answer your question, it need not be invasive or it need not be implanted. Okay, uh, and the next question from Miko Yan, uh, I think that, that if the dust, uh, the, the dust IC cannot work normally, or does it, it is broken, does it mean that we must do a surgery or just replace it by injection? I think that is the question. Perhaps. Um, I think as I mentioned, the, the dust concept may, may, may still re be retained there, uh, assuming that they don't really cause any... Because technically, they don't dissipate power. They're just passive. So they're just resting there, much like that of an RFID. No power dissipation. So uh, I suppose this is still in the uh, studying phase, research phase. But looking at the dimension, they don't try to uh, affect the brain that much. So maybe, but I can go back to that later on based on more updates. They can just rest in the brain because they are dust sizes, so they don't really affect the brain that much, superficially. Okay. Uh, sir, I, I found one other question. Up. So the question was from David. When do you think this technology can be applied to humans? Just to give you a um, hint, uh, it, it usually takes decades, maybe 10 years, uh, to develop the technology and perhaps another 10 years to deploy to humans. Be because, of course, you need to be very, very careful uh, whenever it, in it involves uh, implantation or electrical stimulation. It should be passing some regulation like the IRB or the FDA. So it takes a while. But of course, you don't stop there in your research just because it takes some time. 
So someone has to continue that and so on and so forth. That's how we do research. Okay, Pak Ferry. Okay. Uh, uh, Saya kembalikan ke MC aja, Henrit sama Radit. <laughs> hey. Okay, thank you, Mr. Mikey, for your presentation and for answers. Okay, are there any other questions? It seems like sir, there I'm are. I'm sorry. I will share my email if you okay. have any questions. So I can share the slides also if they will be interested. Okay, thank you. All right, if there are no other questions, let us conclude today's lecture. Uh, we would like to thank our speaker, Mr. Uh, Mr. Angelito Salvario or Mr. Mikey, for giving us today's interesting lecture. We have gained a lot of knowledge today and in, in very, very technical aspects of wearable sensors and uh, signal processings. We thank you for that. Uh, Mr. Ronald, uh, do you want to give some closing remarks? Okay. Thank you so much. Hi, Mr. Uh, Mikey. Hello. Thank you so much for your valuable sharing for our electrical engineering students. Uh, I invite uh, all of students from Atma Jaya to have uh, maybe we have a uh, collaborations with uh, University Santo Tomas Philippines. Yeah, uh, we have uh, in the Philippines have a program like uh, research immersion, right? Research immersion. So uh, the student can plan the study, for example. Uh, for 2019 and 2020 students maybe in the future can plan to for example i'm interested to have a research collaboration with uh, university of santo thomas uh, you can plan uh, from now so uh, uh, the faculty and the department will facilitate you to collaborate with university of santo thomas so uh, the process of MOU in the is in the progress now, so we uh, we can and also in your side, Mr. Mickey, maybe if your students interested to have a uh, collaboration with our students or our uh, lecturer, uh, it is welcome for uh, University of Santo Thomas. Uh, I think that's all the remark from. Uh, in behalf of Faculty of Engineering and also Department of Electrical Engineering. Uh, I say thanks for your time, for your sharing. Thank you. Pleasure, no, no, no problem. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before we close our today's lecture, uh, let us open our cameras and take a virtual photo together. Okay, uh, I'll be taking the picture, or, or someone else might be. Okay, I'll be taking the picture in, in the count of three. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, three more in the count of three. One, two, three, two more. One, two, three, smile. Okay, and last one. One, two, three. Okay. Uh, to Mr. Angelito, we thank uh, uh, we thank you again on behalf of the students and lecturers. 
and ladies and gentlemen, thank you for attending today's lecture. I wish you all a very wonderful, wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.